Hello, and thank you very much for linking into this uh, webcast. Um, my name is Manuel Salto Tellez. I'm the Chair of Molecular Pathology and Professor of Pathology in Queen's University, Belfast. And this lecture uh, is trying to analyze the impact that genomic medicine is having in the practice of tissue and cellular pathology and suggesting ways in which perhaps we can considering uh, uh, training uh, the new generation of pathologists. In an uh, um, area that changes substantially in very little time, it may be worth indicating that this is a talk that was given for the first time on the 21st of July 2017 in a workshop organized by CM Path and we are recording it today on the 8th of August of, of 2017. The CM Path, as a background, is essentially an initiative by the National Cancer Research Institute program in the United Kingdom. It aims to achieve the change that is needed to support academic cellular molecular pathology in the UK and making the results benefiting the diagnostic and the research community at large, both in the UK and globally. What I am presenting today is the analysis of a group of people in the work stream one of CM Path that is dealing with training with a skill and capacity. This is work that I have co-led with Professor Lewis Jones. And as you can see, there is a large number of people that have contributed to this reflection. Talking about molecular pathology the genomic impact and the change in training of molecular pathology, I would like to address three questions. Why is it necessary to transform the way we see pathology and train new pathologists? What it is that we need to train the new generation of pathologists? And perhaps some ideas on how we can start thinking on training pathologists differently. Let me start with the why. This is a reflection that goes back a few years that it started 10 years ago in these papers. It was clear that pathology at the beginning, a few centuries ago, was pathology of the dead, which were essentially analyzing autopsies to learn physiopathology and to try to understand how we were linking changes in the dead bodies with the physiopathology and the symptoms that these patients had when they were alive. And it was only probably at the middle of last century that pathology of the dead became the pathology of the living. In the word of somebody, it was like transforming pathology from dead to living. What happened at that time, led by a series of people in different parts of the world, is that pathology became immediately a clinical discipline. So much so that no oncologist, no clinician, no surgeon would decide on a treatment option for the patients or would prognosticate the disease unless there was a full surgical pathology report supporting that evidence. At that point, pathology became not only therefore the main tool for therapeutic decision making, it also became the central life in many academic hospitals at the time. Reality, however, it started to change and it started to be challenged by several people at several levels. Here you have an example of the then director of the National Cancer Institute back in 1999 that challenged the scientific community to essentially lay the ground for changing the basis of tumor classification from morphological to molecular characteristics. As you can imagine, Pathologies felt quite threatened at the time. And in fact, this process has transformed medicine. There is no question about that. Personalized medicine, cancer immunotherapy are a product of this new vision of understanding cancer. However, it didn't work quite like this. It didn't change the classification from morphological to molecular. Indeed, what it did was to create extra layers of molecular complexity between the surgical pathology report and the therapeutic decision making. Ten years ago, the single biomarker testing were still a bit modest compared with today, but as you can see, there was already a layer of biomarkers that were important. 
even more so when we started bringing multiple biomarker analysis. Remember at the time, NGS was still not a reality and we were thinking more about gene expression signatures or the world of pharmacogenomics. And this process was the process that started worrying some of us. As you can see, pathology will always be there. The morphological analysis will always be there but there were significant layers of extra complexity on top of our morphological analysis. Or like one director of the College of American Pathologists put it once when he was kindly using this material in one of his lectures, the value of traditional pathology has not diminished, it's simply no longer sufficient. And it was clear 10 years ago to us that for pathologists to continue being relevant in the practice of medicine, we had to take ownership not only of those single biomarker tests that were directly applied to cells and to tissues that we diagnose morphologically, but also to multiple biomarker analysis and also to pharmacogenomics. Indeed, what we are saying here is that we are creating and considering an extra layer apart from clinical medicine and traditional pathology, the layer of molecular pathology of molecular diagnostics. It's important to own this component of medicine. Why? Because the future of modern medicine is going to be dictated, among other things, by molecular medicine. And indeed, molecular diagnostics is arguably the fastest growing area within medicine. And it's important to highlight as well that this comes into flavors. Certainly, using nucleic acid testing to bring molecular diagnostic forward but also to start considering tissue hybridization-based technologies, immunohistochemistry in situ hybridization, as tools that are also molecular diagnostic tools if they are used in a certain way. So what is it that we need to teach our trainees in modern pathology or in molecular pathology? These are a series of, if you want, bread and butter tests that are applied today to tissues and cells. As you can see, we are talking about the detection of translocations in sarcomas, in lymphomas, testing of clonality in lymphoproliferative disorders. We are talking about testing of microsatellite instability or the expression of mismatch repair proteins. And we are also talking about a large number of tests that are predominantly therapeutic in nature. RAS testing, BRAF, EGFR, ALK in different ways all the tests that we are doing with CNS tumors and gliomas, ERPR and HER2 in breast cancer, all the tests that we are doing in melanoma and in gastrointestinal stromal tumors, and perhaps as a second line, other tests that we apply to the pathology of thyroid in urological pathologies or in gynecological pathology that are not still widely accepted, but definitely are used in certain laboratories. And this bread and butter testing probably needs to be defined or redefined today by the development of five other important areas. The concept of molecular immunohistochemistry that we will discuss in a second, the development of next generation sequencing as a diagnostic tool, the existence of digital pathology as a diagnostic tool in molecular diagnostics, the development of cancer immunology and the beginnings of liquid biopsy testing and how that is correlated to tissues. So very briefly, we detect lymphomas and sarcoma translocations because we know that it's pathognomonic of a very specific subtype of lymphoma or sarcoma with a very specific presentation, with a very specific diagnostic framework and with a very specific therapeutic intervention sometimes. We do a fair amount of testing in gastrointestinal tumors, and in fact, many of them are routine in many of our laboratories. For instance, RAS testing in the context of colorectal cancer, we wrote the guidelines or the guidance to do this test in the UK recently, and these have now been accepted and referenced in other international guidelines. Many of these tests, the therapeutic tests, are very much based in the power of genomic targeted therapy. That is very important for patients, but at the same time is a very modest development. What we are doing here is to, if you want, buy months, sometimes one or two years of life to patients. Unfortunately, as you can see, 
these patients come back with recurrent cancer in the majority of the cases. Obviously, they're very important tests, very important therapeutics for our patients, which are essentially allowing them to live longer lives and, and better lives. The paradigm of lung adenocarcinoma is very important. Until recently, the lung adenocarcinoma classification was very, very relevant. Again, these are survival curves from the IPAS trials, were one of the first EGFR trials, where you can see life is essentially the survival curves that we mentioned earlier. In the center, the two yellow curves are essentially showing us what is the, the survival of patients on chemotherapy with or without an EGFR mutation. The green curve on the right is indicating the survival advantage of patients with EGFR mutation if we are giving TKIs to these patients. The green curve on the left is showing the problem of giving TKIs to patients which do not have the mutation. Not only we are not helping the patients, we are probably providing a disservice to them. The same happens with BRAF mutations in the context of melanoma, both from the point of view of BRAF and MEK inhibitors. Again, the same curve where patients have a survival advantage and where most patients recur after a period of months or, or one year. Breast cancer is a different development in itself. That was one of the first examples that we have of precision medicine where the tests are more mostly immunohistochemistry and in situ hybridization, although we are beginning to see recently perhaps the possibility of up to 10% of these patients where personalized medicine can begin to be considered based on a mutational status, and there are already clinical trials looking at this. HER2 provides very interesting lessons for the pathology community. Our group, together with many other groups at the beginning of the century, suggested what were the best ways of scoring HER2, ways that were adopted by international guidelines like the ones you have now in the screen. These guidelines essentially indicated that you could test patients by immunohistochemistry, confirming the results with a genomic approach if you were in the 2 plus scenario, like this slide is showing on the left hand side. Or you could start with a genomic approach, confirming the threshold area with other methods. Obviously, there is a feeling that the cost effectiveness of this process lies on the left, and that was essentially the way we all adopted the two tier test sometimes of HER2. But immediately when this started, other people started considering that perhaps this was not a very wise approach. For instance, here you have a study where we are looking at almost a thousand samples that have been analyzed by immunohistochemistry by local and community hospitals and have also been analyzed by fluorescent in situ hybridization in a central hospital. And as you can see, almost 8% of the patients that were positive for fish and therefore should have had Herceptin treatment probably never had because of an immunohistochemistry result of 0 or 1+. On the other hand, you have almost 10% of the patients with a negative fish and therefore not very likely to receive Herceptin, and yet they probably did so because of an immunohistochemistry of 3+. Plus. This created significant confusion at a European level, at a US level, where at some point there was an indication that perhaps 20 to 25 percent of accredited laboratories were doing the test wrongly. In Australia, as you can see in this slide, the mess was so extraordinary that the rule is that you can only give Herceptin when your immunohistochemistry tests are confirmed in one of the central labs by in situ hybridization. A very clear indication that probably we can do things better. As I mentioned earlier on, all these bread and butter tests are currently being revisited by new realities. One reality is what I would like to call molecular immunohistochemistry. What do we mean by that? What we mean is that probably there are different types of immunohistochemistry. The descriptive one, the one that we use to decide if something is a melanoma or a sarcoma or a carcinoma, which is interpretative in nature, but then the one that is therapeutic, the one that has to do with ER, PR, HER2, ALK, PDL1, even mismatch repair protein expression. Here you need a degree of quantitation in most of these biomarkers. 
and quantitative immunohistochemistry for therapeutic decision making, as you can see, probably requires different rules of validation and also different rules of being carried out. We think that molecular immunohistochemistry probably belongs more to the framework of molecular diagnostics than to the classic framework of pure morphological pathology. Next generation sequencing is a technique that is here to come. This is a very busy slide, but hopefully will allow me to make an, an important case. So in the top part of the slide, you have a world map that is color-coded according to the total spent in health as percentage of the GDP. These are WHO figures. As you can see, if the country spends less than 5% in health, then is orange-colored, for instance, India. If it is expenditure of 5 to 6.5%, that is colored as green. For instance, Mexico, if it is more than 6.5%, for instance, Australia, then it's colored blue. The lower part of the slide has a few bars that are giving us an indication of an efficiency score that is based on life expectancy and the overall amount of expenditure in health for each country. And these bars are colored in dark blue if the percentage of private expenditure in health is above 40%. Why am I telling you this story? Because obviously the best examples that we have today on how to apply next generation sequencing routinely come from American examples. This example of foundation medicine or the sample of Memorial Sloan Kettering. Obviously, here we are talking about examples in a country which spends a significant amount of funding in healthcare that has a relatively low efficiency in a score in healthcare and that spends a significant amount in private funding. If you can compare that with the UK or with other countries in Asia or in Europe, you will see that probably the way we introduce these tests routinely should be different. And this applies for any diagnostic test and probably for any new therapeutic intervention. We are applying NGS in diagnostics today mostly through panels. The panels can be as small as the class one that you can see here if all you are using is the bread and butter standard of care today. If you want to add all the mutations that will allow you to bring your patients to certain clinical trials, then you may want to consider a class two. If you are working in an institution that is very relevant for a cancer type and you want to know everything that needs to be known from the point of view of diagnostics or research, you may consider a class three design. If you agree with Fogelstein and his group, and indeed by knowing the status of four or 500 genes, then you know everything that you need to know in cancer as far as genomics is concerned, that you may want to consider a class four. Depending of where you are and how you operate, is it close to diagnostics, is it close to discovery, or is it related to clinical trials, you probably will choose one class or the other. It is very important, though, to indicate clearly that more and more, and more relevant is the interpretation of those results. And in these early stages of genomic medicine, we are probably managing at most levels of uncertainty. So for every case where there is a clear-cut, unequivocal consensus on how to treat, there are probably others where the results do not even begin to tell us what is the best way of treating these patients, and others, as you can see, where we have different levels of clinical uh, certainty on how to act upon a very specific um, result. The report from Professor Sally Davis, the CMO of England, on how to start incorporating genomic medicine in our routine is actually very, very telling. As you can see, Professor Davies bases its analysis in the fact that the 100,000 genomes is giving the UK a significant advantage, that we need to bring genomic medicine, embedding genomics in national standards, creating a streamline of laboratories, and making sure that the genomic information is as secure as it can be. And the model is probably going to mean that the genomic information is going to be generated by a few laboratories and then is going to be devolved to the places where it's going to be put in the clinical context. Molecular digital pathology is very important and very relevant. In fact, when you compare pathology with other areas of pathology and laboratory medicine, there is a very clear contrast. 
if you look at the way we are doing biochemistry or even we are doing molecular virology today, we are talking about platforms that are seamless where you put a sample in one part of the chain and you get a result at the end of the path. In pathology, in tissue pathology, things are very different. You get your sample, you take that sample to trimming, to tissue processing, to tissue embedding, through microtomy, then you would probably stain that with an h &E, hopefully in an automated manner. That is then scanned or not to get a digital image, and that digital image or the glass slide is analyzed by a pathologist and in a percentage of samples that is going to lead to a result. More often than before, we would probably need immunohistochemistry or in situ hybridization in that process. That will be done as an analysis manually or digitally and then will lead to a diagnosis. And again, in more and more cases, we're going to have to annotate that sample for nucleic acid extractions that those nucleic acids will be analyzed for single biomarker testing or they may be analyzed for high throughput testing, uh, the results then having a bioinformatic curation ahead of a clinical diagnosis. I don't know of any process, any pathway in medicine that is as fragmented as this. And we need to start getting used to the fact that digital pathology may help at least at three levels. In the decision of the uh, histological diagnosis, in the scoring of immunohistochemistry or in situ hybridization, or in the annotation of the sample ahead of molecular diagnostics. This is now possible for many reasons. In fact, the first FDA-approved system that recognizes that the digital image is not inferior to the glass image in making a diagnosis is already available. In fact, we probably are going to transit from a digital pathology that today is allowing us to make morphometric analysis, analysis in the context of limbs, getting a clinical and imaging records, having a repository of images that will help our scoring, having access to PubMed, to a series of algorithms that will be run in the background of the scanning of the image that will be presenting to the pathologies at the time of diagnosis other things like analysis of this is benign or malignant, for instance, in the context of prostate biopsies, an indication of tumor area or tumor content, a grading of dysplasia, an indication if something is still in situ or is already invasive, a scoring of immunohistochemistry that we do, etc. And then comes the area of cancer immunology. This is obviously very important, both in, from the point of view of adaptive immunity and immune checkpoints. Cancer immunology is bringing us to a environment that we have never seen before. For certain cancers, melanoma, lung cancers, we are beginning to see with immune checkpoint therapies long-standing survivals like we've never seen before in those cancers for a percentage of cases. What is the biomarker associated with this new development? Is it mutational load? Is it the nature of the immune response? Is it any other pathway, molecular pathway, that is associated with these changes? Is it a mixture of the three? Well, all this may be in the future. Today, right now, is a very simple immunohistochemistry staining that is allowing us to make the diagnosis. Again, a reminder that immunohistochemistry is, in some occasions, a molecular technique and has to be adopted as such. And of course, we're seeing the world of liquid biopsy coming to us, not only in the context of EGFR, for instance, because we can detect the mutation that was actionable originally as an indication of molecular recurrence, but also the presence of other resistant mutations that are beginning to be actionable, for instance, with this AstraZeneca compound in the context of EGFR uh, tbin 790 m how do we start incorporating this kind of peripheral blood testing together with our tissue testing is a very important challenge for our community. At the end of the day, I think it's important to remember that pathologies are generators of information, but also integrators of information. Pathologies generate molecular information. They consolidate that and integrate that with information in immunohistochemistry and sometimes in electron microscopy. And they put that in the overall clinical pathological context to reach a final pathological diagnostic opinion. It is essential that we are involved in the generation and in the integration of molecular diagnostics.
this morphomolecular approach, if you want, is very much epitomized, as you can see, by the logo of CMPATH that is allowing us then to go into the very next stage. How are we going to change the training in pathology to start incorporating information on the molecular basis of disease? This tissue microarray-like image is trying to include all the options that we can consider today. One option, obviously, could be what the college is, is suggesting today, to have a couple of weeks of visit into a molecular diagnostic laboratory with some other information delivered online. We think that this is, even in the short term, probably insufficient. And as part of CM Path and this workshop, we are discussing options of bringing this into a broader three-month optional module for those who want to go a little bit deeper into molecular diagnostics. We developed in Belfast a model that works within the confines of what is available today that allows us to give lectures to our first-year trainees, that allow us to offer a attachment in molecular diagnostics that could be up to three months if the trainees want to, where they report with us all the molecular tests that are associated with cells and tissues. And then for those who manage to finish at the end of year four, then we offer a fellowship-like structured training that would allow them to be experts in molecular diagnostics or perhaps experts in a subspecialty area like GI or breast, where they also incorporate all the armamentarium of molecular testing. This is an interesting model. It's a model that hardly ever works because it's very seldom that a trainee has finished its training, has finished its exams, and all the number of biopsies that they need for their training at the end of year four. So this is an option that so far in our laboratory has actually been taken by people coming from other countries, not from the UK. What we have done very obviously is to map what would be the content of the training within those two or three months of attachment and also what would be the content, the very broad content for those that are with us for a whole year. Another option, which is probably the option that at this point our CM path favors more widely, has to do with a two-tier model. Before that, let's consider the MSc model. The MSc model incorporates an extra year of training to training that is already very lengthy, five years, when you compare it with other training models in other parts of the world that can be as short as three or four years. The other problem with this model is that there are very few MSCs that are actually focusing in molecular diagnostics. Many of them have to do with molecular pathology and usually with different levels of research and diagnostic mix, but never specifically molecular diagnostics in nature. The possibility of creating a modular training is probably the one that is more favored today in our group. This will indicate that those who want to be predominantly morphologists can continue to do so, but at the same time, we offer a model. In this slide, we call it two and a half plus two and a half, but obviously the length of time in each of the portions of training can be different, where people are trained as genuinely morphomolecular pathologists. This new program is, I'd say, an alternative program. It doesn't aim to substitute what we have today, but to create an extra avenue for training. Obviously, not every center would have the know-how and the capacity to deliver it. It would have to be delivered, first of all, in very specific centers. We proposed a share of time between training in morphology and training in molecular diagnostics. The model would obviously require the trainee to decide up front the area or the areas of morphology subspecialty that they want to focus on, and then they would be trained in molecular diagnostics. We may think that this is a difficult model to map, but indeed much of the content of what a model like this could be has already been identified by the Royal College in the analysis that we did when we developed an FRC path program for clinical scientists for acquired disease. And here you see, for instance, a potential time frame for a training like that. Forget about the specific shares of a specific month, but probably something like this would have a portion of general histopathology and cytopathology training, followed by general exam, 
followed by subspecialty morphological training, followed by an exam, and then the molecular training, followed by a third exit exam. And here you have some of the main characteristics of what would be the overall training content. And here you have a specific models of how this has been defined, for instance, for techniques and technologies for lymphomas or for lung cancer. So what we are suggesting is essentially a consideration of a model that would be modular, where the curriculum content will have to be redefined, where the ways of assessment would have to be redefined, where the validation of centers to be able to take all this work will have to be redefined as well. And for that, the workshop in which we presented uh, this lecture for the first time discuss some of the issues and some of the potential hurdles of bringing something like this into practice. There is a broader picture here, and the broader picture is that society, clinicians, scientists, are demanding more than one type of pathologist. Obviously, with our training programs, we are training primarily diagnostic histopathologists and cytopathologists. But we need to start bringing academic pathology farther into the forefront. Some people would like to be molecular tissue pathologists or immunopathologists. More and more often, subspecialty training will need to equip our pathologists with the molecular dimension of training not only the morphological dimension. There will be room in some of our big departments for digital pathologies or for computational pathologies. We would need to have biobanking, and this sometimes will be run by pathologists, as we will probably need clinical trial coordinators in the area of pathology for those centers that have a high volume of clinical trials. We would need to have more and more experts that are able to link biomarker discovery and validation with pathology practice, and probably we need to rethink how we see comparative pathology as a whole. It's very difficult to think on the vast majority of these scenarios without a strong molecular pathology component associated to it. This is very relevant, and this is very important. It is likely that the future of medicine is going to be dictated by how relevant is the information that we bring into the patient discussion in the areas or in the concept of an MDT or an MDT-like discussion. Now, classically, there were a few people or a few groups sitting around that table for therapeutic decision-making. This table is going to get more and more crowded in the near future. And it will be the relevance of the information that you bring into that table that will dictate the information that you're going to bring into practice. And in fact, this is very much mind of the Sally Davis model that we were discussing earlier on with a few certain centers generating the genomic information and many more centers interpreting the genomic information and bring it into the clinical context. It would appear, therefore, that genomic interpretation is a very key element of where modern diagnostic medicine is going to. Allow me to finish with an important note. More than 10 years ago, I believe, a key member of the American pathology profession he used to talk about the future of pathology like this. It used to show a front image of one of the medical journals indicating that pathologies will take center stage in patient care. In this vision, he thought that January 2020 would be the time in which the pathology community will recuperate, will get back to this center stage in patient care. More than 10 years ago, we had a lot of time to achieve this. January 2020 is very close by, and it may be the time in which pathologists need to decide if indeed we want to be center stage or if we want to leave the center of the stage to others. Um, thank you very much for, for your attention. Allow me to thank uh, Professor Louis Jones, uh, uh, Dr. Karin Oyen, and, and the rest of the CM Path team and the Workstrom One for all the um, discussions and the write-ups that we've done uh, over the last year. Uh, it is likely that you'll see some of these uh, um, uh, ideas in editorials or review articles uh, in the pathology literature in the near future. Um, thank you very much for your attention.